a few minutes late. To, uh, we have a deadline today with for bill introductions, and um, so trying to get all of our ducks in a row. Um, so, are there requests for bill introductions, Representative Featherston? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm here to request um, RS3030 to be introduced through the committee. It allows nurse practitioners the ability to sign DNR orders. Okay, committee, do we have questions regarding the introduction? Is there any objection to requesting this introduction? Uh, Representative Penn. I, I, we'll hear this if you so choose. I was just curious as to why a nurse practitioner would need to sign a DNR. Um, Representative Penn, if if this bill comes back to this committee, then we'll discuss it then. Um, I just, I, I, I have a, um, I guess a, a um, traditions not the right word that I want to think of, but I don't I don't um, refuse a, a request for a bill introduction to, from other representatives. So, uh, but then it'll be the speaker's decision where this bill would be assigned. So, um, okay. Any objections? Okay. Seeing none, the request will be made. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Penn, if you want to talk, I'd be happy to chat later. Are there further requests for bill introductions? Yes, Mallory. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mallory Lutz with Little Government Relations on behalf of the Kansas Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics requesting introduction of 22 RS 2565 relating to procedures and investigations of child abuse or neglect and requiring a child abuse review and evaluation examination. Thank you. Are there questions? Are there any objections to requesting the bill introduction? Okay, seeing none. The bill will be introduced. Okay, I have one, um, RS number 3083, requiring DCF to review certain needs of the child before giving consent for an adoption and the court to determine such a review occurred. Are there any, requ any questions regarding that? Any objection? Okay, seeing none, the request will be made. Any further request for bill introduction? Okay. Um, so the only item that we have on our agenda is Melissa Johnson to give us an update from the Child Death Review Board. So hi, Melissa. Welcome to the committee. Members of the committee. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the State Child Death Review Board to um, provide you just an update about the committee's work or about the board's work um, since the last time we spoke with the committee last year. Um, so just kind of a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Um, since 1994, the State Child Death Review Board has reviewed over 12,000 deaths of Kansas children or children who die in Kansas from birth to age 18. Our completely volunteer, multidisciplinary, 10-member board annually reviews every child death in Kansas, and we're only one of a handful of states that reviews all child deaths. In 2019, there were 362 child fatalities. That's the lowest number um, since the board began reviewing cases. Of those cases, we had 212 natural deaths, 65 unintentional injury deaths, 23 homicides, 28 suicides, and 34 that were undetermined, um, but 28 of those had some um, factor in there that was a sleep-related death. For some reason, males in Kansas die um, in higher numbers across all categories of death and across all age groups. 
The rate of infant mortality in Kansas is continuing to decline. When natural deaths of infants are excluded, 79% of those remaining deaths had at least one element of unsafe sleep in the infant population. Overall, the child mortality rate for children ages 1 through 17 continues to trend downward, and motor vehicle crashes um, also continue to trend downward, where the highest number of deaths we're seeing in motor vehicle crashes are occurring in unrestrained occupants of the vehicles. In 2019, which is the latest data um, that's available and was published in our annual report last October, suicide rates dropped, and we're hopeful that that trend will continue. Um, there is a concern that our homicide rates are continuing a slight trend upward. In 2019, 35% of the homicide deaths were due to child abuse, nine were gang violence, and the remainder didn't fall into one of those two categories. Some highlights from our annual report, um, the vignettes that are on page 48 of our annual report highlight the need for a continued um, work towards thorough and complete investigations when there are reports of child abuse and neglect. In that vignette, um, the board talked about, um, through de-identified data, a young child that was reported to have choked while he was eating dinner. Medical care was initiated but they were unable to save the child's life. At autopsy, the child was found to have a skull fracture, multiple sites of bleeding in the brain, and abdominal injuries that were caused by blunt force trauma. There was also evidence that the child had been exposed to illicit drugs. DCF had received a report of alleged physical abuse to that child about a month prior to his death, and the case was still open at the time of death. Ultimately, DCF found the allegations were unsubstantiated as the caregivers had denied abuse and the child didn't seem afraid of the caregivers. There were pictures showing bruising to the child's face. Other concerns had been reported to law enforcement by family members, but it didn't appear that there was any communication between DCF and law enforcement about the allegations before the child passed away. There was no evidence that the child was ever evaluated by a child abuse pediatrician. In the board's report, we included this statement. It is not uncommon for a parent's statement about a previous or current injury to a child to be taken at face value without attempting to corroborate that statement. Statistically, a parent or someone close to the parent is most frequently the perpetrator of the abuse. By failing to interview collateral witnesses, review the family history, consult with others who have had contact with the child, and obtain medical evaluations, some Kansas children are remaining in dangerous situations that unfortunately have too often caused their death, even after concerns about that child or their siblings have been reported to professionals. Some recent cases have been covered in the media, but the, uh, it should not be assumed that all cases received the same level of media attention. On average, of the child abuse homicides in 2019, there were nine contacts with DCF prior to the event that caused the child's death. Of child abuse fatalities, biological parents or the significant other to a biological parent continue to be the suspected perpetrator in over 75% of those deaths. Of the 362 deaths we reviewed, 130 of the children had prior history with DCF's Division of Child Protective Services. If natural deaths are excluded from that group, 54% of children had prior CPS involvement, and among the homicide deaths that the board reviewed in 2019, 70% of those children had prior CPS involvement. The vignettes that the board um, discussed in its report on page nine highlight some de-identified examples of our concerns. In one case, a child abuse homicide victim's family had 36 prior reports to DCF, including allegations of physical abuse. None of these reports were ever substantiated or affirmed. The child or their siblings had no documented history of examination by a health provider with specialized training in child abuse. In a separate case, a teen who was in state custody was in foster care. Law enforcement reports indicate that law enforcement shared concerns with the child being in that environment several times 
with the state contractor, including the night prior to the death of the child. At that time, law enforcement warned the contractor that something bad was gonna happen if they placed the teen back in that home. The teen committed suicide the following day. In a third um, situation that's highlighted in the report, a child between the ages of five and nine died from complications of methamphetamine intoxication. There had been multiple reports to DCF about substance abuse in the home and siblings had been placed in out-of-home placement twice. Both law enforcement and DCF were unaware that the autopsy determined the death was due to methamphetamine intoxication and both agencies closed their files and indicated that the child died from natural causes. The board was concerned for other children who may have remained in the home as well as the lack of a timely criminal investigation into the death of the child. The legislative priorities that the board indicated in our report last year were to require medical exams by a pediatric health professional with specialized training in detecting and assessing potential child abuse injuries, and that the legislature consider further modification to KSA 22A 243 to provide local fatality review teams confidentiality protections that are consistent with what the Child Death Review Board is provided at the state level. The board believes additional changes need to be made to KSA 22A243 um, because of a floor amendment that um, some of you may remember was made last year. In that amendment, it said the board may disclose information and records to any entity established by a city or county for the purpose of providing a local review of child deaths if the information and records being disclosed are related to a child's death in an instance when such death occurred in a city or county and such child was a resident of that city or county. In trying to create a process to release information, which the board is mandated by statute to keep confidenti confidentially, we've explored statutory protections that are currently provided to the local fatality review teams, as well as their draft bylaws that were provided to us by the Wyandotte County Youth Fatality Review Board. While the State Board applauds the initiative and interest and work of the Wyandotte County Group, we continue to have several concerns related to confidentiality if we release information to them or any other local team. Currently, there appears to be no statutory confidentiality provisions similar to what the State Death Review Board has. For example, if the State Board maintained a suicide note in a particular case, that information is shielded from disclosure pursuant to KSA 22A243 subsection J. That statute provides that the information shall be confidential and is not subject to discovery, introduction in legal proceedings or subpoena. Um, in my other um, portion of what I do at the Attorney General's office, um, I'm a criminal prosecutor. I've actually had defense attorneys try and subpoena records from the State Child Death Review Board on cases I was prosecuting, thinking that I knew something else from that process um, because of the protections provided in, two, in 22A243, um, the court denied that request, um, not because of anything that hadn't been turned over in discovery in the case, but just because that statute provided that protection to the board and also to the families of these children. If the same suicide note was requested from the local entity, they would have no legal protection to prevent disclosure to third parties. The practical effect of that is we may release information to a local fatality review team, but if we do, we're likely violating the statutory provision that requires that the board shall maintain the information confidentially. Effectively, by providing information to local teams under the current statutory structure, we're eviscerating the confidentiality protections of the State Board. To date, the only local fatality review team that's contacted the State Board is the team from Wyandotte County. They've provided us their current bylaws, and um, they, those bylaws identify the Unified Government Public Health Department which is a government agency or a government entity as the sponsoring agency for the local fatality review team. Their bylaws go on to state that the meetings of the Youth Fatality Review Board and any subcommittee shall be closed to the public and that the meetings are not subject to the laws regarding open meetings. 
However, there is uncertainty whether any local board may be subject to the Kansas Open Meetings Act and the um, Kansas, uh, or in Kansas, the State Child Death Review Board um, are, those meetings are public except when the board goes into executive session pursuant to KSA 75 4319. One of the specific provisions for an executive session under the um, subsection 9 is the State Child Death Review Board um, to discuss matters relating to the investigation of child deaths pursuant to KSA 22A243J. There's no corresponding provision which allows local records to be confidential and it is a concern whether a closed meeting would potentially violate the Kansas Open Meetings Act. If it does, the information would have to be discussed in an open session, which would again expose confidential information needlessly. The also, the State Child Death Review Board currently obtains information from a wide variety of sources to help us develop a confidential or a comprehensive review of circumstances surrounding the child's death. If our records are routinely open to third parties, many entities such as law enforcement may be uh, reluctant or decline to provide records to us if they know that their records will be released, particularly if law enforcement has an ongoing investigation. Additionally, there's no current guidance in KSA 22A243 as to what any entity means in terms of reviewing local child deaths. If a city establishes a one-person entity to investigate a single death because that person somehow has an interest in the death of an individual child, should that entity be treated similarly to that of an ongoing team with developed policies and procedures in place? Because the statutes are currently silent on the standards for any entity, the board has attempted to create a system that would be workable for Wyandotte County, but also for the other 104 counties in the state. As part of that process, the board attempted to promulgate rules and regulations to set out what types of information we're able to release what confidentiality measures should be in place, and how information could be shared between the local entities and the board. Unfortunately, that's a lengthy process, and we've kind of reached the point that we think we need additional statutory changes that we can't accomplish that specifically through rules and regulations. Um, there are concerns that um, there may be um, CORA or COMA issues related to um, the meetings as well as the information that's released. Additionally, we're not able to monitor this, or we're not able to model this rather other, after other states as the other states function in a way where local teams provide information to the board rather than get information from the state board. So um, this Kansas statute currently um, is set up to work a little bit differently than that. So um, specific to Wyandotte County, some of the data that we have on page 75 of our annual report, um, that out of the 155 deaths of children in Wyandotte County in 2019, as we understand the local um, board's parameters, they would review 40 to 50 of those cases if they exclude natural deaths and SIDS deaths. So their um, focus is a little bit different than the state board. We do. Um, zero to 18, zero to eight, age 18, as we understand it, um, the local board in Wyandotte County wants to review deaths of children that have already turned one and then go up to age 24. So a little bit different focus on um, where they are at, but that is the update um, on the Child Death Review Board, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And Sarah Hortenstein, who's the Executive Director of the State Child Death Review Board, is also here to answer any questions. Great. Um, appreciate the update. Thank you both for being here. Uh, committee, do we have questions? Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the, um, in the one area where you spoke of multiple uh, claims of abuse and the police had reported and DCF had gone, did that just fall through the cracks or were reports not exchanged? Because I know only the police can take a child out of a home. But where did the communication fall? That the board doesn't try and determine fault 
As far as any particular agency, we just report out that there was a lack of communication there, that that's something that needs to be strengthened to make sure that we don't have other situations like that in the future. One more question if you have me. Um, how many cases have you come across, and you gave us some totals, uh, over the years that have the same problem of lack of communication? I can't give you a specific number of cases, but that is something that the board has noted in our annual report for multiple years, um, that we see a need for increased communication between all of the different entities in um, the um, child welfare system. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, based on your last response, you may be unable to uh, respond to this question as well. But that was also very concerning to me. And I was wondering if uh, either Adrian's Law or the Office of the Child Advocate would be in a position to prevent some of those circumstances going forward. Uh, but I don't know if, if you would be able to have an opinion on that. Thank you. I think anything that helps everybody communicate with each other and make sure the decision makers have the right information. Um, I know one of the things we've highlighted in past reports were that um, with the state contractors in the child welfare system, when they were making placement decisions, sometimes they didn't have access to DCF's computer system to know if the person they were placing the child with um, had any past history with DCF or any concerns. Um, just because you had two different entities, especially um, when placements might have to take place in the evening or on weekends, um, just making sure that the people that were going to have to make the decision had access to the right information. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Helmer. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is... Um, I was a... a I retired as a licensed counselor with the school district, and I just introduced with Superintendent Thompson um, and super, Assistant Superintendent Terrell Davis in USD 259, a curriculum through Jennifer White with ICTSOS. Uh, she wrote it and won an award. Uh, it's with Murdered and Missing Children. And so they're writing it so it can be worked through Wichita School District. And as my experience with, with children in Wichita, I saw that a lot of the problem was I filed a lot of DCF reports, but it was real hard to follow through. And so... I think that curriculum is going to help in teaching those children, getting that curriculum in the school district, USD 259. And um, they're willing to share. That was the idea, getting it in the Wichita School District. So, so be it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Wagoner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, again, very good report. Really appreciate it. Were, were you surprised that 54% of the kids who died from, you know, non-natural causes had been involved with, is it with DCF or with the children's, um, I mean, is that an abnormal percentage or is that pretty much what you expected? I think that would be consistent with what we've seen in past years on um, the information that the Child Death Reboard is able to report out. I don't think that was an anomaly. And if I may ask, how, how many children basically in, in, are in the system in some way? That, that, that I mean, is this like 50,000 kids total? Or I don't know. How, how many would you say? I don't, I don't think it's that many, but I would defer to DCF on a, an exact number. I wouldn't want to speculate on that. One final question. Uh, the, the change in the uh, law from last year about adding a pediatric health professional with specialized training, I, I guess my just immediate question is, how, how many pediatric, pediatric professionals with specialized training are there in the whole state? I mean, is that, is that going to be a hard thing to accomplish, to have them 
I don't think that like day one that you would have sufficient numbers, but I think through a training program that we would be able to download some of that information into the more rural parts of the state because my experience has been most of those people are going to be clustered in the metropolitan areas around the state. But, you know, through telemedicine and, you know, different things like that, um, I think they could and would be willing to um, help share that knowledge. Thank you. And I, I don't know if you realized it, but that was one of the bills that was introduced today. Or, um, and I've got some questions on, on that as well, um, but I think I'll, I'll hold them for when we have the hearing and we can visit about it or we could visit about it later. Um, Representative Hoy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I appreciate the report. This is my second year now um, reading through these reports and um, just really digesting what this means for families in our state and looking at um, the numbers of gun-related deaths. And it mentions under unintentional, there are a handful of deaths involving weapons, um, unsure what type of weapon. It could be a body part. And then it says for the gang-related violence, gun violence was the cause of death in all 11 homicides from 2013 to 2019. In homicides, uh, when the perpetrator was a stranger, 90% of those deaths involved gun violence uh, as opposed to 46% involving gun violence when the victim knew the perpetrator. And then when we look at suicide deaths of, of children in our state, um, gun-related suicide deaths are um, the leading cause for young males in our state. And I'm just wondering, do we have information on for 2019 of how many deaths uh, of children in Kansas involved a gun? I'm going to defer to Sarah. She uh, and her team do all the work on the report, so I'm not sure it may be um, contained in there in the report. Let me see if I can point you to specific places. Representative Howe, I actually think that you're um, fairly correct. Um, the only other um, the only other manner of death that could potentially be a weapon that wouldn't be listed in this report would be undetermined. So you would be what you reported for suicide and homicide would be <clears throat> the total minus if there were any from undetermined manner. But since that is not given, the numbers you're reading is what we have to report. Thank you, Madam Chair. And there, some of them are hard to compare because they're, some are grouped in different years. And so I don't know, is that a request that we could make to get that information provided or um, something that could be added into the report? Okay, um, just so I understand, what additional specific information are you wanting? Or are you just wanting um, the tables to compare the same year so you've got apples to apples? That, that would um, be able to provide that information. Um, but for now, I, I, from the last two reports, I've, I'm not able to tell um, each year how many of the child deaths um, are related to gun violence, whether they were gun-related deaths. Um, it, you, it doesn't seem to, um, you can't get like an exact um, representation of that. And But it, if you do look at those, it seems very alarming that it's a gun-related deaths are one of the leading cause of deaths of children in Kansas. We can certainly take a look at that. The board um, is only permitted by statute really to give out information through the annual report, but that's something that we could look at and see if we can improve the report for next year. Other questions? Representative Penn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And on the and thank you so much for your testimony here today. Um, as a man of faith, I just want to let you know to you and all the members that I see on the uh, review board, you have my prayers. You guys march and walk where a lot of people don't. Thank you. Uh, so uh, for your spirits and for your minds, I'll, I'll pray for you. Uh, that said, uh, last year we had the governor veto uh, a bill for children uh, to practice gun safety. Uh, hearing the representative's questions, uh, could you guys give us any indication as to any experience that you have with other states if that type of training would actually bring down those types of uh, deaths that are involving a firearm? 
I don't have any. Specific. This is this is with uh, kids, uh, K through twelve. I don't have any specific information on that to know. Um, the review board isn't really to um, determine whether any political position is good or bad. It's just to try and report out the information that we have. Um, find the areas that we think are of concern and then um, leave to your wisdom the policy determinations. Absolutely, Madam. And, and my question isn't about politics, it's about uh, seriously the impact of training sure. and how it would bring those numbers down because one child's life lost is too many. Sure. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the wonderful job you do. I've read through your books the last two years and it's outstanding strongly support that we need the pediatric doctor training statewide to go with what has already started in Johnson and Wyandotte County. I think I would also propose that we need to add that into our Kansas Law Enforcement Training Academy a curriculum for specialized training for investigators who could learn, see some of the things through these doctors. And I'm going to promote that's something that they could do on their own clearly our our agencies that support different law enforcement training because um, it is a very specialized form of training would you would the attorney general's office be supportive of that or oh i don't want to speak on behalf oh. of the attorney general <laughs> I, I'll, I'll leave that to him okay. to to decide uh, what he is and is not in favor of thank you so much dear um, Melissa, I have a question on the um, bill that I think we passed it last year regarding your um, communications and confidentiality with, um, see if I'm saying this right, that if you find wrongdoing in your investigation that now you can report that back to law enforcement where previously you could not. Mm -hmm. Have you had instances since we passed that bill to use that? We have not yet. Um, we're, um, we have been able to use the national reporting system, so we're in the process of switching all that information over, and um, we're trying to figure out, you know, as a policy decision, do you go back and use previous years? Do you go forward? How, how's the best um, way to approach that as far as whether it's prospective or whether it's retrospective? Um, so we're still working towards that. Representative Hoy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to follow up um, on the discussion that we've had of some of the prevention uh, issues. On page 57, it does um, offer some prevention points um, under the context of preventing suicide, early diagnosis and treatment of mental conditions, observation of behaviors, evaluation, transition of treatment, and it does mention limit access to lethal agents. It says easily obtained or improperly secured firearms and other weapons and means such as prescription and over-the-counter medications are often used in suicides and the more children have access to these items, um, it, someone should intervene. So um, I do think it, it does um, provide families clear uh, information that um, adults seem to make sure that uh, firearms and dangerous items are secure and um, children don't have unsupervised access to those. That, that, was, that wasn't a question there. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, it was a follow-up since there, there was a, a question about um, uh, types of, of legislation and things that could help prevent um, these deaths. Okay, Representative Owsley. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, committee. I have a tendency to ask my questions last in case somebody else wants to ask it first. Um, but on the uh, on the Senate floor amendment uh, last year, I'm, I'm skimming through your testimony here, and I didn't. See, I saw where you guys said that additional legislation was needed, but I didn't see an example of legislation. Do you guys have suggestions of how to improve upon that? We. We were working towards that. Um, we got to the point that we thought there were core violations potentially if um, the records were closed and there wasn't statutory authority. Um, we got to the point that we thought there were potentially coma violations if the meetings were closed and there wasn't any authority to do that. 
So we looked at trying to do that through rules and regulations, um, but that didn't seem to be able to go far enough. And so when we started going through um, the CORA and COMA information, we thought that there probably needs to be some legislative action to create an enabling statute to create these local teams. And once we got that far down the road, that's probably outside the um, ability of the Child Death Review Board to be able to uh, make recommendations as far as policy decisions on how those should be created. And I ask because to, today's a deadline. I think Thursday's a deadline. Um, so our session deadlines are coming up. So if we were going to address that this session, um, it, it would need to be going. Um, is this something that could potentially wait till next session without causing uh, too much trouble, or is this something that needs to be addressed now? From the state board's perspective, um, we're continuing to operate as we have before um, the um, provision was placed in there about the lo local teams. Um, any detriment would be um, for local teams that are wanting that information and whether or not we have something in our records that we're not able to give them yet. Okay, well, maybe, maybe we can get together um, after committee, after session, and, and work together to come up with something that does make that a functional um, legal operation. And then if I may, Madam Chair, I have one more question. Um, while we're talking about rules and regs and legislation, um, uh, part of the Child Welfare uh, Oversight Committee recommendations was when possible, the Child Death Review Board should include information in its report regarding sexual orientation gender identity and race and ethnicity. Is that something that can be done with rules and regs uh, amongst the board or is that something that needs statutory change? That I don't think um, actually probably needs either. Uh, we try and report on what we think is of interest and of note. Um, the issue we have with that is just gonna be making sure we have accurate and complete information because um, that specific um, area isn't going to be something that's contained in a police report or you know isn't going to be contained in school records so it, the information we get is pretty sporadic about that so it's just having enough information that we think we can say something intelligent that's going to be a complete picture and is that something you're looking at right now currently we're, we're looking at that to see if that's something that we can include in next year's report and we just have to see um, what data we have on that. Um, as a member of this committee and the Child Welfare Oversight Committee, I would like to see that information if it's accurate and where applicable. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further questions? I don't know how you always know that you're going to be last. <laughs> yeah okay uh thank you thanks so much for being here and I appreciate what you do this is a tough topic and uh, we appreciate the opportunity okay committee um we have a full week um i can't remember tomorrow's because i don't have that in front of me but um i have a feeling I'm not going to say what I have a feeling. I think it is. Okay. Um, we're going to have some discussion tomorrow on House Bill 2271, which you'll remember that is the bill that we had a hearing on last year that um, um, Representative... Um, um, Thomas, um, it, it, that's his bill. Um, done some a little bit of further work on it, and so we'll be having. Um, uh, we're not going to reopen the hearing, but have some discussion on that tomorrow. And um, I wanted to give you a heads up on.
Well, I thought I had one scheduled. Uh, Mind. I thought we were going to have a hearing on one of the bills that was introduced today. It's informational. It, it's on. Okay, sorry, sorry, you guys. On Wednesday, February 9th, um, there's an informational hearing that's referred to as Efforts in Child Abuse Investigations. That will become a bill hearing once we have a, a, a the bill is uh, introduced and we'll, and we'll have a number. But that's what the topic that we were discussing today with the um, seeing a certified pediatric physician. Yeah. Yeah, that's different. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. <laughs>